Michael Turner is a Geelong great, a member of the club's team of the century and a former captain. Yet he has been at odds with the Cats throughout the 25 years since his retirement. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Michael. How's the relationship between Michael Turner and the GFC at the moment? Uh, the easiest way to explain it, I suppose, is that my father played for Geelong, so he's a double premiership player. I played there for 15 years, and I think when you finish your career, you've got aspirations to coach, and I was interviewed for the coaching job twice, which you mightn't realise, with Malcolm. Which, which two positions? Well, when Malcolm Blight got it when I retired, yep. uh, it was indicated to me by a couple of board members at that time that I had a chance to coach down the track. So you have that in your mind, and Malcolm Blight should have got the job. The strategic mistake I made was Ken Gannon offered me um, the assistant coach's job and Malcolm had to verify it and I knocked it back and went and coached Werribee because your ego takes you away from the place I suppose it's rejected you. So, But, but Malcolm got the job and then the second time was when Gary Ayres got the job after Malcolm left and, and that was fair enough. He was the appointed person. But um, I think as an ex-player, an ex-captain, that you just want to be involved in the club and then there was a couple of opportunities as time went on when football managers' positions came up that um, it was indicated that I had a fair chance of getting one of those positions and I didn't and uh, in the end for my own peace of mind I really just had to walk away from the club and for forge my own career, look after my family, uh, look after my lifestyle and go surfing and, and work for AFL Victoria which I have for 20 years running the Geelong Falcons so you've just got to move on. You've got a lot of pride though, I suspect that your pride was pricked and, and you just sort of said well stuff them. I think the last time it was because... Um, was the, sorry, interrupt you. Was yep. the last time when Neil Baum got the footy ops job? Yeah, and, and there's no qualms about that either because Barmy's a great bloke and he's done a fantastic job and, and Geelong have had 10 years of sustained success. They've done really well. But as an ex-player, you'd like to be a part of that success also and I think I've you know, proven over time that I'm a good administrator at what I do. Mm -hmm. But I've got no problems with the Barmy one. The problem I had was that a senior uh, board member of the Geelong Football Club when the review was going on with Mark Thompson, mm -hmm. which you remember, and Gary Davidson and all that... Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation about me. I approached a board member to see you know, whether the speculation was correct. Within probably 24 hours, I had a phone call from another senior board member indicating that I was going to be the next football operations manager of Geelong and to start preparing. So as I do, I prepared a flow chart of positions and all that and gave it to them. Unfortunately, all the people that I had on the flow chart got jobs and <laughs> I missed out. So, you know, at that time, Mike, you know, I was pretty disappointed about it. I was, I was bitter about it. And I just, for my own peace of mind, walked away and said, well, look, you know, I've got to forge my own career and I can't be, you know, thinking about this all the time. And then, of course, where you're tagged is that they had their 150-year celebration a couple of years later and it was still a bit raw for me mm. and I didn't go. Was that a mistake? Yes. Oh, well, in retrospect, it probably was, yeah. I mean, I had everyone come at me to try and get me mm. to go. Uh, Sam Newman rung me, Ken Gannon rung me, you know, Andrew Buse rung me, you know, Billy, um, Barry, St um, sorry, Barry Stone and Billy Brownless came and saw me. But, but look, I, I really in my mind thought the Geelong Football Club, or not the Geelong Football Club, I've got no problem with the Geelong Football a person at the Geelong Football Club or persons had done the wrong thing by me and I didn't want to be a part of it. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I didn't want to be um, annoyed with the Geelong Football Club and then go to one of their functions and be a hypocrite. What did you say to those blokes when they're saying, come, just, come on Mick, we've all had problems down along the way, just come because you're a part of this footy club and, and, and the, the Turner family is such a big part of the footy club. Yeah, and I don't think Mum was too happy that I didn't go either because they had to respect the dad. But look, I'd been to a lot of Geelong functions. I've been to the team of the century. That was, that was a much bigger function and um, my whole family were there, and uh, yeah, you were it was in just that one of those team, things. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my father was on one wing, and Amazing. I was on the other. Amazing. It's, yeah, it's an, uh, the Silvanis did it at Carlton, but I'm not sure there's anyone else. So there's the Turners at Geelong, yeah. and the Silvanis at Carlton. It's a massive, uh, massive honour, isn't it? Yeah, no, it was a fantastic honour, and that was a great night. I mean, Dad had died, and Mum was there, and I had two tables, and uh, even though people say I'm a bit tight, I paid for one table <laughs> and got the other one for free, and I had Ricky Barham, and yeah, all, all of my good friends there, and the team of the, and my sons were both there, my wife, and uh, the team of the Century night was a fantastic night. You were pretty good player, Michael. 240 games. Well, that's 280 a, goals. Yeah, well, that's a good that's, number for a winger. Yeah, well, it was a long career. It was a 15-year career, and I had a fair few injuries. I missed, you know, quite a few games with injury, well over 80. So maybe I had a better run with injury. I might have played 300, which takes you into another status. But you know, I had 15 years of you know, football at Geelong, and uh, look, it was challenging. I'm not, I'm not a real football head. There's other things in my life that interest me, but I pursued football because I was good at it. Mm -hmm. If I had had a choice, I actually played the drums as a young bloke. I would have been in a rock band. That would be my first choice. Really? Yeah, and second choice would probably be a surfer. Like, I would have liked to have been a surfer like a Wayne Lynch, uh, that style of surfer, but I could surf, but not at that level, and football took me in a direction because
because I was good at it. So you go and play football. So how passionate were you about the footy? I mean, did you were you nervous before games? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, look, I was a Geelong supporter. I went and watched Geelong. Dad obviously played. I, I love the Cats, you know, and I, I got nervous before games. But look, football when you play for 15 years, as anyone will tell you, is, is a challenging thing. And you have your ups and downs. You have injuries. You have controversies. You have problems with the club contracts. We didn't have player managers at that time. AFL clubs at that time or VFL clubs virtually owned you. You couldn't get a clearance. Mm. Um, I had clubs like Richmond and Collingwood chase me quite a bit, but you couldn't leave the club. Not that I wanted to, because the money wasn't there to leave, and it was very difficult to leave. So, so th there were challenges there, but it was it was a long career. You you didn't win the best in first at Geelong, which I must say surprised me. Yeah. Because uh, you, you're in the top 20 at the club for games played and for goals kicked. Yeah. No BNFs. No, well, I just uh, as a wingman, I thought uh, you know I was a little bit inconsistent at some times. I'd play really good games and play some ordinary ones, so the votes didn't build up. And, and quite often in those days, you'd get beaten by Ruckman, and nothing against Rod Blake or John Mossop, <laughs> but the big Ruckman who played in the centre and played a kick behind the game got a lot of marks, a lot of possession, and a lot of votes. So, I mean, I was happy to be runner-up. I think I was runner-up three times. I you know, bet you weren't, like, Mick. I yeah. bet you're fibbing about that. Well, it would be nice to win a best and first because yeah. it again gives you an, a, a bit of status, I suppose. Which is the one that you should have won? Do you think? In 1980, I, I came home with a fairly big rush. I had a big season in 1980. This was um, past you know, when Sam Newman retired and before Gary Ablett and Greg Williams. So, you know, I'm not pumping up my own tyres, but I was probably the marquee player at Geelong at the time. And we were in the finals under Billy Goggin. We were top of the ladder. You know, we got knocked off in the preliminary final. I had a big game out at Waverley. So, 1980, I was probably at my peak. And, and after that, I had a couple of you know, pretty bad injuries to my knee and my Achilles and that, which um, maybe slowed me down a little bit. 1980, Geelong tops the ladder. Yep. Goes out in straight sets. Yep. 1981, you finish second, I think, after the home and away series. Yep. Uh, no, uh, no grand finals in either of those years. Yeah, no, it was disappointing. We we, we had a really good build up. Rod Olsen was at the club before Billy Goggin came, and he really did get the club very organised. He was a fantastic bloke, Rod Olsen, good coach, but very good organiser. And then Billy Goggin got the job in 1980 and put us to the top of the ladder. We could not get over um, Collingwood in the preliminary final. Got beaten, which I played in. The next year we got peaked to the club. Side bottom missed the bus. <laughs> it was a balls up. We went to Waverley. I was injured. Um, and uh, you had cook ribs, did you? I had cook yeah, ribs. Yeah. And uh, if we had won that game and got to the grand final, I was going into hospital that night to get a nerve block put in so I could actually play in the grand final. So uh, we couldn't get over Collingwood again. And uh, the next year in uh, in '82, we had an ordinary year, and Billy Goggin was sacked. And that was pretty much a Geelong football club at that time. It was pretty political and a lot of times in my 15 year career there were good people there but a lot of times it was pretty dysfunctional. You mentioned Gary Sidebottom and the bus. Yeah. What's your version of what happened there? I think the, uh, you've got to understand how Billy Goggin works and I got on well with Billy Goggin. He was a very good technical coach and he'd get into your head and if I was having an ordinary run he'd, he'd really give it to me and test me out a bit. Now that suited me, my personality. It didn't suit every player and I'm sure with the Gary Sidebottom one they dropped him but they're always going to play him. But someone didn't tell him that he was going to play. Really? Yes. And whether that was Billy or whether it was Jeff Ainsworth, Chairman of Selectors, whoever it was, someone didn't tell him. And when the bus used to leave Geelong, he was to be, he, people used to get picked up on mm -hmm. the way. You'd meet mm -hmm. the bus. He was going to be picked up at Lara where Geelong bought him a farm and he didn't show up and, he didn't show up and uh, catch the bus. Now, who's so fault didn't that? someone ring him? Well, whether they, whether they should have rung him or not, whether Billy should have rung him or whether Ainsworth should have rung him, he's still a very highly paid player. Yep. Living at Lara, the bus is going past. He should have been on the bus. So I... I blame, yeah, some of the club officials, but also blame Gary Sidebottom. Yeah, I understand that, but mm. if you get to Lara and Gary Sidebottom's not there, mm. Lara's not Los Angeles. I mean, didn't nah. someone go looking for him and sort of say, hey, Gary, you're supposed to be playing with us today? Well, dysfunctional. We're in the preliminary final. That's right. And we, and we needed him. 1981, you mentioned uh, Brian Peake. Mm. He comes across from WA and probably the biggest arrival of any player in my time in football. Yeah. A helicopter to Cadinia Park. Yep. He's unveiled as the next, you know, almost like as if he was supernatural. Yeah. Uh, what are well, your memories of Peaky? Oh, no, I've got, uh, I've got very, uh, I've got good memories and all those things. Look, Brian Peake was a fantastic state of origin player. I played against him for Victoria when we played West Australia. He was unbelievable and he was a great player for East Fremantle and Geelong chased him for a long time to the, to the fact that they thought if we get um, Brian Peake and, and a Gary Sidebottom, another forward, that we'd win a premiership. So I can understand the club's tactics on doing that, but it was the level that they went to to get him. He flew in. There's, I had no problem with the helicopter helicopter coming down, it was great promotion, there was 10,000 people yeah. on the ground, but you know, um, I think I was the highest paid player at the time at Geelong, I was on about forty-five to $50,000, and one night 
in a hotel in Geelong. Brian had had a couple, and I'd had a couple, and he, whether he was lying or not, and I don't think he was lying, he told me his package was $120,000. Now, that didn't go over all that well no, with me, Mick. I don't think you would have liked that at the no, time, I Michael. I didn't. I don't think other players did either. And, um, and Brian, 13 games later, again, um, after playing for 13 games, was made captain of the club. Now, I'm not saying he shouldn't have been at the club, but to make a player captain after 13 games... So they took the captaincy off Ian Nankervis? Yeah. They were bad decisions in my book because it mucks up the culture of your club. Mm. Um, you know, players become disenfranchised, they become disappointed, and loyal players like the two Nankervis brothers, uh, they shouldn't be treated that way. You kicked um, four goals... 20 times, four or more goals, 20 times in your career. Amazing for a winger. Did you kick five on my favourite Melbourne player, Robbie Flower, one day? Well, Robbie and I had a lot of great battles on the MCG and um, Ron Barassi, in his uh, knowledge, put him to the back flank one day at Geelong and I did play on him and uh, I was lucky enough to kick five on him. But, you know, Robbie Flower beat me a lot of times and I suppose I, I beat Robbie a few times. I used to actually build myself up, you know, mentally to play on Robbie Flair because it was it's a great battle. And in those days, there were a lot of great wingers mm, around. There were. You know, Schimmelbush and yep. Greg and Barham. And Who was the Toughest. Who was the one uh, skill who you, wise who you were most fearful of if he had a big day that he could embarrass? Well, Robbie you? Flower was a great player to play on. Schimmelbush was very hard to yep. play on. Keith Gregg, because of his size, could mm. really was very hard to handle. So a lot of there were a lot of great wingers. Every week was a challenge. You had Merv Nagel, you know, mm. Gary Folds, um, Doug Hawkins, so you can run through lots of them. So it was, it was a real battle each week. You were made captain at Geelong, but there's a, I don't know, fact or fiction that Tommy Hafey's preference was Neville Bruns and the board overruled him. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, I think I think that's a reasonable assumption. I think at the time, uh, the feeling I was getting that Neville was probably in a good position to, to get the job. Um, but I think uh, in terms of when the board met, um, I think there were people on the board that sort of favoured me. And, and the question was asked about Neville Bruns and Michael Turner and the board came to a decision with Tommy that it was going to, going to be with Michael Turner. So, look, I was really thrilled to be captain of Geelong and it certainly made me a better player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your captain, there's a lot of responsibility, so it make what I was talking about before with attitude, you've got to accept that responsibility and you've got to perform every week because you're the captain of the club. So I, I really enjoyed being captain, so that's why I was probably disappointed when I was sacked. Was there a day when you came off the ground at Geelong mm -hmm. and thought you'd let yourself and the club down? Not as captain, I, I didn't. No, I, just in, in your career? In my career? Yeah. Oh, look, I, look, I always categorised, I was always, always happy after a game, and I think most players are the same, and this is not being selfish, when the team won mm. and you played well, you felt really good. Uh, if the team lost and you played well, you were probably pretty satisfied. Uh, <laughs> when you felt really... No, you, well, you that, no I, that's honest. Most yeah, players and, wouldn't say that. And that's just that. being honest. And I even say that to the boys you know, at, the, at the Geelong Falcons. Your number one responsibility to the team is you've got to play well yourself. Because if you play well and the other players play well and you put it into a team aspect, the team's got every chance of winning. So I come back again and it's not selfish. If Geelong win and I play well, I'm over the moon. Mm -hmm. If the Geelong got beat and I played well, I was probably satisfied because I knew I contributed to trying helping Geelong win. The days you were disappointed was when Geelong lost and I played a bad mm. game because then you walk away and say, well, I've let the team down. After the break, the Ablets. 1984, you're captain of the Geelong Footy Club. Yep. A couple of blokes called Gary Ablett and Greg Williams lob on the scene. Yeah, they were handy. <laughs> <laughs> what are your memories? You know, I mean, I, there's a famous memory. Greg Williams sat in that chair two years ago yep. and said he's playing his first practice game for the Cats. Yep. And he said, Turner... Despite the fact you were captain, stand over there. Yep. You ignored him because he's a chubby little bloke from well, Bendigo. I don't think I did ignore him, actually. Well, did, well, he said that. He said that you yeah, didn't take any notice of him. Oh, no, that, that's a true story. And when Greg first came down to Geelong, yeah, we knew he'd been rejected by Carlton quite a few times because they had such a great midfield. And he came to Geelong and Tommy Hafing gave him the chance. But you could see at training how dedicated and how skillful he was. And we'd played a practice game down at Anglesey. And I actually went to Tommy Hafey at the time and said, look, don't worry about playing Brian Peake in the centre. Greg Williams needs to play in the centre because he's going to make 15 blokes play better with his handball, play Brian Peake, Ruck, Rover or Ford. So we went to a practice game up the bush, uh, up the Murray where our zone was, and we were playing a game against the Kangaroos, and the game had been going for a while. I was playing on Gary Cowton on the wing, and Greg Williams was playing in the centre, and he just came to me and said, look, when, when the ball's bounced, if you read it and I read it and you think I'm going to get it, just run forward. So that happened. The ball went towards uh, the Ruckman. He tapped it to Greg. I could see what's happening. I just took off and he hit me with a 30-metre handball right onto my chest. Well, opening round, Michael. Yep. Geelong are at home to Fitzroy, who'd played in the finals the previous year. Yep. The Geelong centre line is Turner, mm -hmm. Williams and Ablett. Yep. Two blokes playing their first game in Geelong colours. Yep. You had 88 disposals between you yeah, and, and well. four goals. 
Well, the centre line didn't stay together too long, but it was always the famous Richmond one compared to that. But, yeah. you know, I think we only played three or four times together. But, look, that's when Ablett was at his absolute best. He was, well, you he said, was well, an you, animal. Did, you, did he shock you when you saw him, yeah. say, that day and, and that season? Oh, that... Look, he shocked me in the pre-season because I was already, already getting my head around Greg Williams and getting fairly excited that we were building a really good side. And, and Ablett, you know, came down with a massive reputa reputation that Bill McMaster said he's the best, you know, footballer we've recruited. And he said, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> There's a lot of great players have been through the club and one night at training we had kick to kick you know the old fashioned kick to kick you get into fours and you'd practice your yep. marking and I was paired with Gary Ablett and look I rated myself I could mark against the best of them I reckon the ball was kicked up and down 20 times and I was one on one with Gary Ablett and the only time I got it was when he dropped it once <laughs> so I just couldn't get near him physically I could not get near him I couldn't jump with him I could not get the football and I walked to Tommy Hafey after that and said look Bill McMaster's right we've got something really special here and he was very special. He was. Yeah. He's a bloke with the same name that uh, went through the Geelong Falcons under you. Yeah. Gary Ablett Jr. is pretty special too, isn't very he? Special. Mm. Yeah, very special. How special? People ask me this question a lot. So Gary Ablett, definitely the most spectacular player I've ever seen, probably that's ever played AFL. And he's up there with Kerry and all those people, Tony Lockett. But Gary Ablett Jr. to me is a better player because he's an all-round player. He defends, he masses the ball, he makes other players play well, he tackles, he kicks goals, he does a lot. He's not as spectacular as his father, but to me... You know, being involved in the football industry, when you watch the whole gamut, you look at all the stats, mm. he's a better player. I personally think Gary Ablett Jr. is the greatest player that's ever played the game. You have a <coughs> rare distinction, you know, Michael. You are probably the only person in history to drop Gary Ablett. That's a good trivia question, isn't it? <laughs> so, and look, the, the story is we, uh, we were having a training run down at Warrnambool and the bus was supposed to leave uh, Height and Reserve, our base, at a certain time. And we get there and, of course, Gary wasn't there. He just finished playing for Victoria in the National Championships. He'd left school, was a Surfing, and he said it to himself at the Brownlow last year. He, uh, not that he lost direction, but he slept in a couple of times. So, of course, we're waiting for the bus. He wasn't there. We head down to Warrnambool. I ring him on the way down. I think we had the big motor rollers at that stage. <laughs> yeah. um, and get on to him. He's very apologetic. And I said, look, I'll go down and talk to the match committee about it. But in ha dealing with his father when he was at Geelong, Gary Ablett Senior got away with a lot. Mm. And I was very, um, I suppose, mindful of the fact I didn't want him going down the same track. And he didn't. He was a fantastic kid. So we made the decision with my direction, I suppose, to the match committee that we're going to drop him for a game. So I told him after that we're going to just drop him for one game for missing training. We've arrived at Warrnambool. There were 300 people there waiting for us to train. Mm -hmm. Not to watch the Falcons, to watch Gary Ablett yeah, Jr. Yeah. And after they found out he wasn't there, I reckon there were five people there. <laughs> so he was even big then. Is he the best player that you uh, saw at the Geelong Falcons? At, at, as a 16, 17 year old, the best player I've ever had at the Falcons was Luke Hodge. At that age, 16, 17, he was more mature than Gary Jr. and he was a, just an absolute champion at 16. He's the only 16 year old I've played um, outside a boy called Hugh Goddard, who's coming through the system at the mm -hmm. moment. And he played in their premiership as a 16 year old and uh, he played as a 17 year old. So he was an outstanding player. You allegedly said to Hawthorne, yeah. you'll embarrass yourself if you don't take Luke Hodge at number one. Is that yeah. true? It is true. We went, uh, we, up, we, we had to make a presentation to coach. Damien Christians and I and all on the three clubs that came through they had three names on a board there was Chris Judd Luke Ball and obviously Luke Hodge and uh, we went and made a presentation and all the you know Swabby was there Johnny Hook was there my current boss and all the match committee went through every player now every, every player and I rated every player as I saw them um, you've got to remember Chris Judd was coming off two shoulder operations and um, you know he was a top age player uh, Luke Ball was 17 still going to Xavier but in the end I said we we're talking about Luke Hodge and I just said look you know what does the Hawthorne football club want and they said we want someone who can go and play down back and shore us up go into the midfield and get the ball out of the center and maybe push him forward and kick a goal I said well if that's what you want you need to pick Luke Hodge because Luke Hodge can do all those mm -hmm. things and uh, I said if you don't pick Luke Hodge at some stage down the track it will come back to bite mm -hmm. you and it may embarrass you so look judge a great player balls a great player Luke Hodge is what they asked for and it's what they got. Did you tell Jimmy Bartell to take his helmet off? I did, well, yes, him and his mother. Um, <laughs> and there was a reason for it. When you're selling players to recruiters, there's a lot of perception out there and recruiters are very, well, they're becoming more conservative. It's all yeah. about risk management now. So you need to do certain things with players so that they're presented to the AFL recruiters in the best light possible. So um, you do certain things and we've done certain things with players to make them look more presentable. I'll give you another example of that. Cameron Ling. It's true. Get a haircut, yep. shorten your shorts, is that right? Well, Cameron played as a 17-year-old and was as good as any player, but he played full forward for us and he wasn't tall. And in his 18th year, I was very fear of him not being drafted. And he, he might dispute this, but it's fact that we said to him, we need to get your hair cut 
You know, so you've got short back and sides that makes you look more athletic and taller. Make sure you pull your socks up to make your legs look longer. And we actually got him a size 20 pair of shorts, but size 20s, you don't want him hanging down here, and we got his mother to shorten them so that his legs look longer. Now, we changed his position. He didn't play full forward. We played him centre-half back, centre-half forward, ruck rover. So he played a different role. And I was still feel, fearful in that draft that he wouldn't get drafted. And Geelong, thank God, took him. Jonathan Brown, Michael. Yep. Played a game for the Falcons. I think he's 16, and you're playing the Danny Nong it would have been 17, I think. 17? Yep. yep. And there was an altercation, Lawrence Angwin and Jay yep. Brown. Yep. There's the young Jay Brown there. He's young there, isn't he? Yeah, pick yep. the story up for me. Well, I just added Danny Nong and uh, Brownie Breen. Brownie was a very strong player and um, the ball was just, he went for a marking contest in front of the um, the grandstand. I was sitting up in the in the coach's box and it was just before half time and, and a player who we didn't know at the time was Lawrence Angwin whacked him. I could see Brownie go to the ground and his eyes went straight up to look to see who hit him. <laughs> he stood up and gave him a round armour and, and knocked him out completely. So the timing wasn't perfect at Danny Nong, as you can imagine, Mick. And um, the siren rang, th rang about 30 seconds later and the, the place just arrived. So we got everyone inside at half time and calmed things down and I was really wondering whether we should put him out in the second half because I was a bit fearful what could happen and um, Brownie being Brownie said hey mate I'm you know what he's like I'm, I'm going out in the second mm. half and you know I'll go out and play so he went out and played in the second half and knowing Brownie as Brownie he took 20 marks in the Did second really? half. He was Literally 20. 20 yeah. marks. Yeah. You've got two boys, two sons. Yep. Did they ever say dad why can't we go down to Cadinia Park and why don't we go into the rooms and why don't we mix with the players? They're not really footy head kids. And I, I, Are they you know, strong supporters? Yeah, I, yeah, well, Shane, my youngest one's a North Melbourne supporter for some reason. Why? Uh, well, he just likes the kangaroos for some reason, but they frustrate the Even though the his dad him. was a, uh, yep. the captain of Geelong. Yeah, but I, look, I just think uh, they've been to functions with me. Um, I'm not the sort of person that hangs around the past players and goes to the footy. I mean, I, I work in football. I go, I've got a Falcons game on every weekend. I don't go to AFL games. I certainly watch it on the TV. I watch football on the TV all the time. Not so much to watch Geelong, but to watch the boys that have come out of the mm, Falcons. Mm. Like, I'll watch Gary Ablett Jr. or Jack Stephen at St Kilda. That's my main interest. I watch those boys. So I watch a lot of footy, but my boys, um, they watch footy on the TV, but the, we're not the sort of family that want to be down the Geelong footy club all the time. We're in the past players. I'm just not like that. Do you love Geelong? I, I am a Geelong person and I love Geelong because of the fact... Do you fact love Geelong football club? Yes, I do. 100% I do because my father played for Geelong. I played for Geelong. You don't play at a club for 15 years and not love it. There are some aspects of the Geelong Football Club I don't like, but that's more an, indig an individual thing. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. That's just things that have happened over the years. But people who, who look at me, I'm a Geelong person, and I love the Geelong Football Club. And you know, I, I am in awe of the success they've had for the last 10 years, Mike. Mm. But at the same time, being human, you get envious of it as yeah. well. You'd yeah. love to be a part of it, wouldn't you? Yeah. You I mean, would. the year I retired in '88, when John Devine coached, Malcolm Blight took over the next year. We couldn't make the finals, so I'm off coaching Werribee. Geelong that year were top of the ladder. Mm. They were one minute off winning a premiership. And Paul Couch, who was my best mate, who was dropped by John Devine a couple of times a year before, won the Brownlow yep. medal. So you sit there that year, the year after you retire, and people have got to understand that it's um, it's you do become envious, yep. you know, yep. because of the fact that you've just retired and they've had this magnificent success and you've just missed it. You know, yeah, what that's I mean? honest. Yeah, I, that's yeah, just, and that's just being honest. People, yeah. you're not um, bitter about it. You're just envious. You'd love to be a part of that success. And when Geelong had that under Malcolm Blight and the sustained success they've had the last ten years, um, as an play you look at that and say gee I'd love to be a part of that particularly when you played only six finals yeah with for two wins yeah so it wasn't as if you... No, you, that's right. Yeah. And look, the big thing in those days for people like Robbie Flair again and myself and other players is that yeah, if you're in a team that wasn't playing finals, playing for Victoria was a big thing in those days. You know, mm. that's that's gone out of the game. But playing state of origin for Victoria against South Australia or Western Australia, the people like Robbie Flair and I that weren't involved in finals year in, year out, that was a massive game for us. Mm. And those state of origin games were... They were more difficult than finals. I'm not saying they are more difficult than the grand final, but the finals I played compared to state of origin, state of origin was a lot harder because you were playing against such great yeah. players. Did you did you rise to that level? No, I loved it. I yeah. just loved playing for Victoria. It was a fantastic thing to be a part of. You go away with all these champions and you'd be sitting there and you're a part of it and you go and play with these players. It was just, uh, that was one of the real highlights of my career. Is there a regret? But I just think at various times because of my personality and I've got to take responsibility for this, particularly when I was younger, that my attitude should have been better. But you weren't a full-time professional then, Mike. I mean, mm. there's a lot of things going on in your life. You had to work, you had family and all those things. But if you're playing football now, and let's say you're on $800,000 and you're a full-time professional, you'd be doing absolutely 100% everything right to make sure you played well but every when week. When you mean your attitude, I mean, were, were you a sookie? Were you 
you um, did you resent the um, authority, or what was what are you talking about? I think Matitude was more about, um, and I'll explain it this way: if we were playing at the MCG in front of 85,000 people like we did in 1980, there's a massive crowd there and it was a massive game. I would always play well. If I went to State of Origin, generally I thought I played pretty well. Um, attitude I'm talking about: if I went to the Western Bulldogs, you know, on a on a wet um, day, a bad condition, there was 6,000 people there and I wasn't super motivated, well mm. I'd probably play an average game. Did that lead to confrontations with your coaches? It did, yeah. yeah. It was particularly with Billy Gogg and Billy became frustrated with me a fair bit I think because my, my really good performances were, you know, as good as anything but my bad performances were pretty bad. So when he lent on you, did you answer back? Yes. Yeah, yeah we, had, we had a pretty thorough relationship, Bill and I. Um, he, uh, he dropped me a couple of times and, you know, he brought me back into the side, you know, to psychologically get me up and um, um, you know I, I appreciate I actually liked his coaching I think thought his coaching was really good we talked about Brian Peake Michael yes he's in the Hall of Fame Are you envious uh, am envious a little bit and let me just categorize and say that Brian Peake was a fantastic state of origin player and a great player for East Fremantle when he came to Geelong as we spoke about before look he was a he was a very good player but he wasn't a great player mm -hmm. at Geelong there were I think better players at Geelong at that time and um, um, he, you know he was he was a good a very very good player but but not a great player so so it is the Australian Hall of Fame. Hmm? It is the Australian Football Hall of Fame. I know, and I understand what the AFL is doing, and he was probably nominated by the West Australian Football League, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not having a go at that. You know, I'm happy for Brian Peake to be in the AFL Hall of Fame, but I think what the AFL has got to do is they've got to be fair on the people that may have been overlooked that aren't in the Hall of Fame. And I'll give you an example, uh, and I'm not knocking Western Australian football or South Australian football, but the VFL in those days is, was always still the AFL because the best players came and played mm. in the VFL. Malcolm Blight, Mike Fitzpatrick, Graham Melmose, you can mention them all. Kenny Hunter came and played in the VFL. So it was a very high standard competition. So fair enough to put other people from other states in the AFL Hall of Fame, but please have a look at the players that played for 10 to 15 years and were great AFL players in the VFL then, like Jeff Raines. Is he mm. in the Hall of Fame? No, he's not. Well, he should be. I agree. Wayne Johnson? Same answer. Well, no, he's he not. And he well, should he be. should be. Yep. Trevor Barker. So <laughs> all I'm saying is just make things even. So if you're going to recognise Rick Davies or Graham Corns or um, Brian Peake, I'm happy with that. But please recognise the players that played long careers in the VFL, AFL, because they were great players. Also. What about Michael Turner? Well, that's for other people to judge. But you know, I, I would like to think that um, when you look at people's records, that you know, my record's as good as Brian Peake's. Uh, we did love watching you play. You were a highly skilled player and gave us lots of thrills. Yeah. Uh, and you made a massive contribution to football over the journey. So great to trawl through that, and uh, good luck for the future. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it.